This is an anime. What does it have to say about games? And just how much of a weeb am I? Let's find out today. Hi, I'm Christian and this is Lazy Devs. Today we are doing something completely different. I'm gonna out myself a little bit as a weeb and we're gonna talk about anime. And so this anime that you see right now is called Keep Your Hands Off Aizoken. It's a weird title, stay with me, it's worth it. So Aizoken is a show about three schoolgirls who decide to make an anime and the show kind of tries to teach lessons about animation and undertaking, you know, creative projects. It won a lot of awards and I think for good reasons and watching it I found myself uh, applying all those lessons to game development as well and that's something I wanted to do today. If you haven't watched it, um, don't worry, here's a rough overview. Uh, so initially the point of view character is called Asakusa. I'm probably gonna butcher all those names, I'm sorry. Uh, so Asakusa is an awkward, nerdy goblin girl with an eye for concept art and world building. And uh, throughout the series she becomes the director, the writer and background artist for the projects they're undertaking. Her skills are complemented by Mizusaki, who becomes the main animator and character designer. Mizusaki is a popular girl who comes from a wealthy family, but she turns out to be just as nerdy as Asakusa. But secretly and surprisingly, the real star of the show is Kanamori. She is what appears to be like a ghoulish, ruthless business type who becomes the producer and takes care of the marketing. I say she's the secret star of the show because she has a unique perspective that forms a perfect counterpoint to the dreamy, idealistic other two girls. In regular shows she would be the bad guy, but here she's given a ton of nuance and humanity. She's here to keep this boat afloat and keep the other two girls grounded. Like, Kanamori is the kind of person who would fill in all 30 circles without batting an eye, if you know what I mean. It's just a joy to watch this kind of character because you just don't see this kind of perspective in other shows. Yeah, there's a lot to talk about. I only have so much time. So today I wanted to discuss two scenes and then maybe spin out into an overarching theme that meant a lot to me. Obviously, spoilers are ahead, so if you care about that, this is the point to stop. I would recommend watching either way. It's not really that kind of show that can be spoiled, but you know, you decide. Let's start with episode 3, in which the girls finally decide which anime they will be working on as their first project. This is done in a daydream sequence, which is typical of Aizouken, just roll with it. The problem they have is that they're working on a very tight deadline, but they still need to leave a lasting impression or the club will be disbanded. When I first saw this, I was basically clapping along to all their decisions. One particular drum I've been beating for a while on this channel now is that creative decisions at the beginning of your project have the biggest impact on the feasibility of your project. Quite often, if there is a decision that will doom your project to failure, that decision was made at the very beginning. Conversely, if there's something smart you can do to ensure success against all odds, this is your best moment. So at the beginning of the scene, the team goes through different settings in Asakusa's notebook. They quickly dismiss a bunch of them and settle for something that is the easiest to draw. <laughs> Now, to some of you, this might seem like blasphemy. It's like putting the cart before the horse. After all, the production of a movie should follow the story. The story shouldn't be subservient to the production. It seems like a gross violation of artistic freedom. But the reality isn't as straight cut. Settling for an idea is an exercise in compromise. You often work from both sides to meet in the middle. As I mentioned before, there is often some things you need to give up in order to preserve the things that matter. You need to pick your battles. And this first decision isn't even that hard. In this case, there is no story yet. They are in the process of figuring out what the story is. All else being equal, it's just a no-brainer to pick a setting that will cause the least headache down the line. That way, the team can focus their efforts on the things that matter. And we see more of a negotiation later down the line, 
when discussing character design. Asakusa suggests putting a gas mask on the protagonist because, you know, that will be easier to draw than drawing a face. But Mizusaki would love to be able to show some of her skills with animating facial expressions. The compromise they find is choosing a gas mask with a glass faceplate so Mizusaki can show off the face in close-up scenes. Which is a brilliant solution. Mizusaki wants to animate faces, yeah, sure, but presumably she doesn't want to animate faces in each and every shot. The final character design lets them focus their limited resources on shots that count, where the face is front and center. Picking your battles. Okay, but the most pivotal moment of the scene comes a bit earlier, with the team's toughest compromise. Asakusa initially suggests a tank as the protagonist. Ever the pragmatist, Kanemori likes the idea because big explosions are flashy. Her priority is to leave a lasting impression to prevent the club from being disbanded. But Mizusaki feels left out. She wants to focus on natural, more down-to-earth animation like a human character sliding down an incline. Kanemori thinks this is a waste of time and resources. Such animation is time intensive and isn't flashy at all. But Mizusaki stands her ground. For her, this isn't just a matter of taste, it's the whole point of her being an animator. And she literally shouts that out from the rooftops. And Kanemori gives in. She sees the point. A movie can't be just razzle-dazzle end-to-end. You need some substance too. And more importantly, there is no point in alienating Mizusaki. This will be a tough project and they need all the motivation they can get to pull through. So they just pick both options. They turn this movie into a duel between a tank and a schoolgirl. Which is a costly compromise which may come back to haunt them. But in this case it might be worth it. All in all, this is a good scene. You can see them making smart decisions at the beginning of the project to ensure it stays feasible despite the tight deadline and limited resources. You can see all three characters coming together to develop the idea. Everybody contributes their own perspective to the project. They listen to each other's opinions and are ready to seed points to move towards a conclusion everybody's happy with. So I think it's worth keeping this scene in mind as a reminder of how the process is supposed to go. Because, of course, this scene is pure fiction and depicts a platonic ideal of such a meeting. The characters are supposed to be beginners, but actually the way they act is more like seasoned pros. From my experience, I'm pretty sure in real life this wouldn't go so smoothly. Especially as newcomers, we are prone to dig in our heels on stupid details out of fear of losing creative control. There is this irrational fear of being stuck working on a project you don't like. And so every single issue is prone to become a rooftop shouting moment. Imagine just how frustrating this scene would go if just in the beginning Asakusa had dug in her heels on the more complicated backgrounds, or if Mizusaki had voted the gas mask too. Not only would this choke the creative process, it would have also led to a less feasible project, possibly dooming the entire production. Newcomers are often driven by their specific ideas and desires. They want to make their particular dream game or tell, you know, this story they have been developing since childhood. Creative maturity often means being able to take a step away. After a while working on different projects, you discover that the things that really matter to you aren't necessarily tied to anything so specific. You lose this fear of being stuck on a boring project as you gain faith in your own skills and abilities to add your own touch to whatever you work on. This allows you to be more flexible with your ideas. It opens yourself up to make better creative decisions. And if you thought these were tough choices, just wait for the payoffs in the next episode. Okay, so this is the second scene I want to discuss. So at this point the production has been going on for a month already. This is the midway point. There's only one month left until deadline. ちょっと待って。完成してる動画ってこれだけ?そうです。ミズサキ氏、先週書いてたカットバンゴは4です。今週書いてるカットバンゴは4。1ヶ月弱かけて4カットしかできてないとペースを遅すぎます。全体のペ
And the way she does it is she argues that the animations that she's been working on all this time, that they were just especially hard, right? And the animations that are coming up, they will be so much easier and go so much faster. And yep, I've been there myself. I made those excuses myself and I know how this goes. And I love how Kanemori has none of it. So you rakkan Yes, queen. On a side note, I'd really envy Kanamori here because she's able to dismiss the excuses by just showing a spreadsheet. And yeah, you can do that in animation. You can just track your progress by measuring, you know, how many frames, how many seconds of animation are already finished. And I envy this because you just can't do that in games. You In games, there is no really good way to like objectively measure your progress. You kind of have to use your gut feeling to track your progress. So you are much more vulnerable to excuses and wishful thinking. Hmm. In any case, with the situation being so dire, they do exactly the thing I've been discussing in my 30 circles video. They cheat like there is no tomorrow. So the episode goes on discussing some techniques animators can use to fill in the running time with little effort. What I like here is how even with the cheats, um, Mizusaki finds ways to dial up the quality. For instance, by adding a single frame to this animation loop, the overall result is dramatically improved. And that's funny, huh? This is supposed to be this cheap shortcut, but somehow this also means that Mizusaki's input suddenly has so much more impact. I like how this shows that the cheats are not a creative dead end. They are not a pit. They are a ladder. A ladder. So yeah, the episode goes on. The cheats help, but they are not enough. It is too late for that. The really painful sacrifices are yet to be made. It's just a matter of deciding which bitter pill to swallow. In this desolate scene, Kanamori considers dropping the story and the coloring, just presenting a series of disconnected drawings, more of a manga than an anime. The look on Asakusa's face is it's really heartbreaking here. The project is literally falling apart right before her eyes. They have hit rock bottom. But it is Mizusaki who ends up taking the hit for the team. She finally gives in and starts using digital tweening to speed up her work pace. Animating everything by hand has been her dream and she needs to let it go to give everybody a fighting chance. The alternative is just too dire. And I love how she allows herself to hand animate just the few cuts that really matter to her to make those cuts count. Again, something I have been discussing in my 30 circles video. Welcome to Lazy Devs, Mizosaki. This is a good episode. After the idealist beginnings, it's a painfully honest portrayal of what creative projects often feel like. There's often this difficult struggle, this difficult stage in the middle, because when it comes down to it, you are kind of fighting yourself. You're fighting your own assumptions and ambitions. And often the success of the project hinges on you being able to reconcile those conflicting impulses. So after that difficult episode, let's finish up with something more uplifting. Let's talk about finishing things. So in those videos that I've been doing here, right, I've been talking a lot about compromises and sacrifices, you know. I've been talking about the things that you need to do in order to finish projects and all of this doesn't sound very fun or wholesome. So some responses I sometimes hear is, you know, why even bother? Why even trying so hard to finish projects if it takes the fun away? Why not just working at your own pace and not thinking about finishing, but just like, you know, focusing on having fun and, you know, being like, eh, it's finished when it's finished, you know? And that's one thing that Aizoken does great. It shows you what finishing is like. Because actually it might not be the thing that you think it is. It's um it's complicated. Throughout the show's first season, and sadly there is just one season so far. Uh, the girls actually finish three different animes. 
The final presentation episodes are particularly satisfying because you finally get to see the movie they've been working on, but also because you get to see how they grow from project to project, how lessons from one project feed into the next one. You get to see what finishing feels like. First up, there is nothing like watching an audience react to something you've made. And Isoken goes to great lengths to exaggerate the audience reactions. The movies literally jump out of the screen for the audience and the show is being quite consistent with this portrayal. They really want to drive this message home. Because in many ways it's only now, when the audience gets to see your think, that the thing you've been working on actually becomes real. And this is true of animation, it's double true for games. After all, in games one major part of the experience is the player and their input. So in some ways uh, we game developers are assembling a puzzle in which the final piece is missing. The game only really comes to life when the players come into it to play. And this is precisely why in games playtesting plays such an important role in the process. Yeah, you can learn more from like one minute of watching someone play the game uh, than, than like your own hour of playing it. Um, there is so much value in watching a streamer play your game, whether there's someone with three viewers or there's someone with, you know, 10,000 or 20,000 viewers. And he's got the He's got a shop here. I mean, his run could last. Oh, the cruelty! So obviously that's one major part, but another part is finishing things also allows you to see and understand things about your project you were oblivious of before. You realize which of the things you obsessed about paid off in a grand scheme of things, and which ones were just a massive waste of time and resources. You learn to see and appreciate things you weren't even paying attention to before. Finishing things recalibrates your entire approach to starting new projects. The lessons you take at that moment are incomprehensibly more valuable than anything you've learned until now. If you could somehow plot the value of insights at any given point in a project, it would be a hockey stick. As I often say on those videos, you learn making games by finishing games. And so here's this great little scene at the end of episode 4. The movie screening is over and everybody's in awe, but the girls can't help themselves but to feverishly discuss the things they just now realized. スーツ<笑> Another more obvious thing about finishing things is that it leaves you with something tangible in your hand. You have a thing now, and that thing often opens new doors and possibilities. After releasing their second movie in episode 9, the team is swarmed with offers for further projects. Their studio starts gaining a following. Before they were working in fear of being disbanded, but now they start making a name for themselves. Conversely, not finishing things, abandoning projects or making, you know, half-finished work-in-progress jobs doesn't really help you with anything, not in the same way. You are just back to square one, still working on that thing. Finishing is also like not even the end of it, it's just another step in a much larger process. One that you just aren't aware of when you're still in the thick of it working on your big thing. You need to finish to be able to take a step back and look at the big picture. By finishing a project you also realize that success is not just binary. There's just so much more shades and flavors to success. In Isoken, for all intents and purposes, their second movie is a smashing hit, winning the hearts and capturing the imagination of the entire school. But once Kanemori crunches the numbers, it turns out they were operating at a loss. But yeah, okay, that's to be expected. Marketing and monetization is a whole new subject that you just need experience with. And you can't really start gaining this experience without having something in your hands to sell. 
And at this point, a lot of people say, wait, I'm not about that. I mean, this is a hobby for me. And sure, maybe you don't care about that. Maybe you don't really need to make money off your thing. That's fine. But you are still releasing something into the world for people to enjoy. You are still doing some kind of public communication. Either way, there is a whole new ball game at the end of the project. And the only way to learn that ball game is to finish a thing. And I really love how Aizoken shows you that big picture how it shows you that ball game. This is what Kanemori is about and this is why I love her so much. You know, this could have been a show about making just one single anime, but it's not, it's so much more. It's about how the team changes over the production of three animes and it's so much better for it. There is this one little joke scene at the end where Asakusa thinks of herself as Hayao Miyazaki from Studio Ghibli just because she has two finished projects under her belt and it cracks me up. <laughs> Kanemori-chan! But also, heck yeah, you go girl. And this already would have been really great about the show, but there's even more to Aizoken than that. It's not just, you know, helpful stuff and advice, tutorials and so forth. It's also this nuanced and honest portrayal that sometimes sits unexpectedly deep. So about uh, releasing things, this also sh kind of shows you how releasing things sometimes is just, just not fun. It can be also emotionally draining and downright alienating. There's this beautiful scene at the end final episode that takes place after the team releases their third and most ambitious project. And you can see Asaksa just curls into a blanket and watches her own enemy for the first time and just and she just vibes. I have to say, this one little scene made me really like tear up. It resonated with me emotionally in a kind of way that's difficult to express, and I thought it was a really great way to finish this first season. I could go on, and I might in the future, but uh, that's it for today. To summarize, Aizoken is a show about anime, but the lessons map very well onto game making. I thoroughly recommend for you to watch it if you haven't already, and if you have watched it, feel free to share your favorite insights from the show in the comment sections. What are the things that, that struck you? Also, in true Kanamori style, this month I will be starting a Patreon-like monthly subscription. Yes, finally! If you like this channel and you want to support my work, you can now do so. You can become a monthly supporter over at Kofi. Yeah, they recently started doing a Patreon thing now, so I thought I'd jump on the bandwagon. If you can justify it, I would appreciate any kind of contribution. That is it. I will be back next month with another video. In the next tutorial, it's coming eventually, I swear. See you next time, guys. Bye-bye.